showing life. Woo! Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> here, uh, here on the stage. Um, okay. So, uh, let's talk a little bit about cuboid knob stuff. Um, so from a reflexology perspective, um, especially when it comes to working with athletes, runners, people who have lower body pain, sciatica, anything that's going to be from that kind of pelvic space downward, if you have a lot of clients like that, this is a part of the foot that we need to know from a reflexology perspective and from an anatomical perspective. If we know this landmark well enough, we'll be able to notice whether or not you know, the reflexes surrounding it as well are out of alignment, but physically, like, is a bone not where it should be? Yeah, that's helpful to know just from a massage therapy perspective. But then also, if we lay over the reflexes that we're gonna talk about tonight on this, on this reflex space, we'll be able to not only talk about the cuboid bone as a physical structure for posture, but also talk about um, how we can assess things like whether or not somebody's hamstrings are causing the sciatica versus their quad versus the actual knee. Is the actual knee compromised or is it just muscular push and pull and you know levers and screws and bolts and whatnot? Um, that's the gift of the cuboid knot, just assessing the entire muscular structure of the leg within one small section of the foot. So it's a very quick palpatory way for us to just zone in on somebody with lower body dysfunction. Sound good? Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay, so let me introduce our helpers for this <laughs> evening. So we have uh, Lee Gamut and Metatarsal. Um, these are just, if you don't have a set of feet to visually look at, it's important for you to have, like if you don't, if you can't look at a screen and visualize it, sometimes it's helpful to get like some of these cute little things from Amazon and just like have something that you can look and feel and, and touch. But specifically what we're looking at, we'll get to the, the bones in a second, we're looking at the lateral edge of the foot about halfway down at the proximal head of the fifth metatarsal. That's where we're looking at from a physical bone perspective. So if you wanted to trace your finger halfway down the foot, you'll feel that, that bone, that actual protrusion, and that's where the cuboid notch is going to start. Yeah. From an actual skeletal perspective, this is what it looks like from a lateral view. So about halfway down, we see that, that literal like curve, that jutting out that occurs, and that's the proximal head of the fifth metatarsal that we're, that we're feeling. Now what's interesting about this bone is that it will be shaped differently on different clients. Some clients you won't notice it at all, yeah? And other clients will have it so protruded, yeah? And that tells us directly the state of the knee itself. And we'll talk about that a little bit more kind of when we get into the reflexes. But the bone that we're concerned with is just proximal to that, um, yes, proximal to that, uh, that bone, and that is the cuboid bone. So the cuboid bone is the lateral support bone for the lateral arch. Um, the arch can kind of be divided from a medial and lateral perspective into two postural channels. The first channel is where our cuboid bone links or our, oh my gosh, I'm totally messing this up. Calcaneus, <laughs> the other C bone, um, so the root of the calcaneus then connects to the cuboid, which then connects to our fourth and fifth metatarsals, and that produces our lateral arch, yeah? The medial arch goes above, and that's the, that's the lifted part of the foot, and that's where the talus connects with the navicular, which connects with the cuneiforms, which connects with the first through third metatarsals. Yeah, so we're really talking about the root component of the lateral arch here. Yeah, which for those of you who follow zone theory know, that's gonna be vertical zone four and five, everything lower back, lower body. Yeah, so cuboid notch is right in the center of that. And that tells us all about that four or five joint space and the state of that bone really gives us insight into whether or not this spot on the body is impinged. Yeah. But the cuboid bone, despite being called a cube, is not a cube at all. The bone is, but the actual notch itself represents a triangle. So if you wanted to continue with that palpatory exercise and just like feel that ditch on the lateral side of the foot, find that proximal head of the fifth metatarsal. So we'll start right here 
and we'll call that the prox head of fifth metatarsal. Okay. Once we go there, we then have an incline, a decline, and the plantar surface of the cuboid notch. These three angles tell us the core musculature of the leg. And then we have the proximal head of the fifth metatarsal, which would then tell us about the knee. We have the apex of the triangle, which would tell us about the sciatic nerve root. Yeah. And I find that this is more back of the knee stuff. Um, but we'll go over all of that in a second. So we have this bone, and this bone that's shaped like a cube then produces a triangular structure called the cuboid notch. The cuboid notch goes from the proximal head of the fifth metatarsal up to that actual cuboid bone, down, right by that calcaneal surface, and then across the bottom forms this nice squishy pad of the lateral arch. And that's the direct surface that we're looking at. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, when we have the proximal head of the fifth metatarsal, this represents the knee. So the knee joint can be felt by that proximal head of the fifth metatarsal. And when we look at somebody who has true knee dysfunction, this area will be red, it will be swollen, it will be overly pronounced, and it will be painful to the touch. Yeah. None of those symptoms that we would normally associate with tissues that are inflamed and compromised, then the knee is fine. I can't tell you how many clients come in and they write knee pain on their health history form but I see nothing in the knee reflex. It's all the adjoining structures pulling on the joint. The joint is fine, yeah? Just because the pain is in the joint doesn't mean that the joint is broken. But it's the surrounding structures which, like, like a marionette, pull on the various joints and cause them to go out of alignment, yeah? But if the knee is actually compromised, that's where you're gonna feel it and find it. Sam? When you say overly pronounced, you mean like inflamed, puffy, yeah. that type of overpronounced? You'll feel it, you'll see it, it'll just be more exaggerated than it should be. The body will have wrapped it in protective tissue, it'll normally be hot to the touch, okay. um, there might even be fluid or swelling around that space. Just There will be multiple markers that have coagulated at that spot to like red flag you down and say, hello, there's a problem here, please stop and address me. So once we have our starting point of the knee at the proximal head of the fifth metatarsal, we're going to start by going at the ascending route. And the ascending route represents the quads. So how I found this out is a very interesting story, um, because here in Tampa we have this little thing called Gasparilla, and there's the Gasparilla training that you go to uh, in order to compete in the run, in the races, and in all of the, the events. And so around December time frame, which is like the worst time to start training for a run um, because it's early February or late February, um, I get this influx of clients that has all the knee stuff, all the leg stuff, all the sciatica stuff because they trained and they've never trained in their life and now they're broken because they've exposed all of that dysfunction. But which muscle group tightened first and where the actual problem is, I started to notice that people who had very intense quad pulling, people who had literally like gotten all of that very strong, muscular, hyperactive, very powerful frontal group of the leg to start to spasm, to start to uh, lock down, to get overly tight, which then pulled on the knee, which then pulled on the hip because that's where they attach, yeah? Um, it was all of that frontal cuboid notch tension. And it was literally like a guitar string that you could pluck. It was so interesting. That entire frontal band, that ascending band of the cuboid notch, would get swollen, hot. Physically, it would be too tight to sink into. The body would have formed massive amounts of guarding and protective tissue onto it. And that's how I started to get really good at identifying quad pain. 
couple, you know, stretches where somebody pulls their foot behind and just lets that entire frontal band stretch, and they were perfectly fine. No cortisone shots, no arch supports, no fancy running shoes, just stretch. But don't just stretch the leg, stretch the front of the leg. Because what happens if somebody has quad pain, but they're told to do this? Yeah, it stretches the back, it stretches the hamstring, and it contracts the quads, which are already too contracted. Yeah. So that's, that's angle number one. Yeah, so we go from the knee to the quad. The quad then leads us to the apex of the triangle, and the apex of the triangle is the sciatic nerve root. So the sciatic nerve up top, this was a really interesting one because I had several clients come in with sciatica at the same time. Um, Non-related to running type stuff, they weren't very athletic, they just flared up with sciatica. And what I found was at this exact apex, it was sensitive to the touch, it was swollen, it was hot, and this spot up at the apex of that cuboid notch represented their sciatic root pain. So it wasn't necessarily in the joints, it wasn't in the muscular structure, it was literally the nerve was lit up. Yeah. And of course they had corresponding low back reflex stuff, and they had multiple stress points, and they had just other stuff going on, but it wasn't necessarily muscular or joint related, it was literally in the nerve, which we needed to calm down. From the knee? through the quads to the sciatic nerve. It's like we're traipsing through a forest. Um, then we go to that descending angle and we have the hamstrings. So now we're on, from that apex, we're going down the back of the cuboid notch. So we're going from the apex of the cuboid notch and descending downward towards that kind of ridge just along the calcaneus. So down the back of that triangle, we have the hamstring group. And this was the exact opposite of the quad group. Instead of having all the tension on the front load of the cuboid notch, all of the tension went to the back load of the cuboid notch. And these clients were doing really funny things. They said, Sam, no matter how much I stretch, <laughs> the pain won't go away, because everybody told me to do this, which contracts the hamstrings and lengthens the quads, yeah? So if we find this band of that descending notch start to become hot, painful to the touch, plucky like a guitar string, guarded, as well as you'll even find that the muscles are so strong that they'll pull the bones closer together and they'll almost shrink or collapse that space, creating instead of like an equilateral triangle, kind of like a scalene or isosceles triangle. It's really fascinating. I'm not really big on geometry, but uh, when we look at hamstrings, this is where that forward fold would be appropriate. So just a little bit of a tweaking of stretching regimen would be all you would need to do to recommend for this client. Yeah, It becomes so much more intelligent of a modality when you combine foot reading and reflexology and you start to understand that this whole space is literally waiting for you to redirect the client just a smidge to the right or a smidge to the left. They're on the right track. They know that they need to do something for the lower body. But if they just Google it, we as reflexology practitioners can then give pointed advice. No, the stretches that you should be doing should focus here. No, they should be focused here. Yeah. And there's a difference between those two points. So we look for where on that triangle is the tightest. Then we go to that back point, and that back point for me represents the back of the knee. Sometimes I find this also very true with IT band. Yeah. So uh, back knee plus IT band. So we have kind of back of the knee IT band, but that more lateral kind of out of the way knee stuff instead of the actual like joint. Okay. 
once we go from that sciatic nerve through the hamstrings to the back of the knee, the knee, the only connection that we have left is this plantar surface. And this plantar surface is ruled by the calves. Okay. This is a little bit of a problematic place for us to have tension. Um, calves can be a really fascinating place for somebody to hold their stress. Uh, when I see clients who have this calf line lit up, there's normally some sort of cardiovascular issue because there's swelling involved. Yeah? And the lower body has so much fluid pressure and likewise you'll find so much swelling along that plantar line that really if they did any form of cardiovascular activity, it would help. But then sometimes it's literal tension, like they've done too many calf raises at the gym, um, they're compensating because their shoes don't fit with those postural muscles of the, the soleus and the peroneals and all that jazz, anterior tibialis and you know all that. But then also something as simple as like pressing the gas pedal. Yeah, what if you have a client that drives for work and they're driving two hours, three hours a day and their foot is just constantly on the gas? Oh, I don't understand. I got back from Orlando from that Disney World trip and I don't understand why I have sciatica on the right side. And all you see is that calf line lit up on the right side. It's because your foot was literally on the gas. Yeah, you stepped down that postural strength that you needed all weekend. You didn't stretch out. And so that entire line got lit up and threw that pelvic basin out of balance. So my nephew was diagnosed to, he always had issues with his calves, but mm -hmm. he also drives a truck and does delivery for right. like, and many other health issues, overweight, doesn't exercise. But the doctors told him that he had compartment syndrome, mm -hmm. I don't remember, but they, he ended up having to have surgery for it to release it. And as far as I know, he doesn't have any issues anymore, but is that something that... Yeah, definitely. Yeah. When we look at, and this is where clients tend to be difficult, is it's hard for us as manual therapists, period, to work with a client who wants a quick fix and doesn't want to do any of the work. Yeah. So a client like that could very easily come in to see me or any reflexologist who knows how to palpate for this and say, look, we've targeted the reflex. We know exactly where the tension is coming from. If we just do things to counterbalance that, you should be fine, even as a regular massage therapist feeling for these lines, noticing where the muscles are tight, and then working that specific group instead of wasting your time going front, back, side, side. But if the client is just like, uh, eh, surgery seems like the easier option, you know, of course, compartment syndrome exists and the only methodology is surgery because it's being looked at by a surgeon. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the methodology. Somebody who wants to work on it, great. We have the ability to communicate what kind of yoga poses you should do, what kind of stretching should be done. Talk to your personal trainer about dialing it back here and increasing it here. You know, but then if the client doesn't want to, to chip in, then that's the tough part. With anything, not just with this, but when we look at these muscles being postural and being very much lifestyle related, it can be very difficult. It's easy when, you know, that client example comes through and they just started training a couple weeks ago and they've broken down and we've caught them early <sighs> versus the UPS driver who has been at it for five, ten years going for that pension, you know, trying to, trying to make a living out of it and they can't slow down. They can't not use those muscles, yeah? And if they're not willing to do the compensation work, and actually say, just like golfers, golfers will come, will come in because they've been hitting one side the whole time, and they need to literally just hit a tire from the other side. But if they don't want to spend the time to do that, then it's a lot easier to take a pill, go get surgery, cut the tendon, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. But from a cuboid notch perspective, that's how we do it. We look at the knee at front, then these three different sections of the triangle relating to the three major postural muscles of the leg, and we then are able to palpate and either use a specific modality that we're familiar with, 
or work with stretching with the client or refer them out to a personal trainer who would be able to help them achieve that muscular balance, which is throwing off their, not just their gait, but also their entire frame. Sound good? Okay, so let's talk about this from a mental emotional perspective. Yeah. So the cuboid notes, just like all the reflexes, are not just physical. They are also mental emotional. Okay. When we look at cuboid notch specifically, cuboid notch is on the lateral side of the foot. Yeah. And it's in vertical zone five, which is in line with the fifth toe. Meaning that this whole section, this whole lateral line of the foot, corresponds to somebody's sense of security and how they're moving forward. So pain or dysfunction in this channel has an overall arc of not just physical, like root chakra, like, you know, feeling the legs, but also the idea of being uprooted. Think of that example of somebody who's training for that Gasparilla Marathon, who has never trained before in their life. They're using muscles that they literally have never used. Yeah. If they doing this, if they're doing this for the first time, or at least if they're training like they did it last year, then they haven't trained for, you know, nine plus months. It's literally uprooting the body. But then emotionally, we can talk to them about, you know, what else are you trying to change in your life? What else is moving too fast? What else is leaving you feeling ungrounded? If we find a lot of tension in this area. This general area is also in horizontal zone four. Yeah. So everything from that waistline guideline, which is drawn by that proximal head of the fifth metatarsal, to behind that lateral malleolus, that's zone four, which tells us that horizontally this area also speaks to us in regards to family and relationships. So this notch is naturally going to tell us that there's family dynamics that are being changed, there's new routines, new people, yeah, that are being introduced into the social circle, um, that ability to circle the wagons and be comfortable and safe with somebody's intended like relationship unit might be disrupted. That could look like divorce, that could look like new friends, new environment, maybe they moved, yeah, they physically moved and ha are having to make new friends, new job, you know, all of those moving forward themes, but in regards to the people that they're surrounding themselves with as well. So it's not always a uh, negative thing, it could be a positive change. It could be. And that's something that I find really important to, to talk to practitioners about, especially because some of this can sound overly critical or negative. The body doesn't care if it's good stress or it's bad stress. It's, stress. it's just stress. You get a promotion at work or you get fired, the body still releases the same stress hormones because it's like, oh my god, new, you know. So, when we look at the different sides of the cuboid notch, um, I find that there is a little bit of a mental emotional twist to them. When we talk about zooming in, um, in the, the foot reading book, zooming into a particular area and applying the zones, we can do that. But I find an even, an even more interesting um, way to do that with the cuboid notch specifically. So just to remind you, quads, hamstrings, calves, let's erase this. So the ascending quad portion becomes present. The descending hamstring portion becomes past. And the bottom portion represents resources. So when we talk about this being sense of security and relationship stuff, yeah. I find that when somebody has quad issues, and when somebody has that frontal load of the cuboid notch that's compromised, they're often struggling with literally moving forward in the present moment. Yeah, it's something that is very acute. It's something that's literally in front of them. Yeah, 
versus when we go down the back of that cuboid notch and we look at the hamstrings, it's something that's already behind them that's literally pulling them back, that's trying to make them, like, either they're facing a wall or they're being held back, yeah? The wall is up front with the quads, but that person that's kind of holding them back by the color of their shirt is the past at the hamstrings. And when I find that the calves are really loaded, I often find it's a question of resources. This is money, this is property, this is um, the emotional resources, yeah? But somebody doesn't have the, the substance that they need in order to make that change. That could be, you know, with a zone four or zone five correlation, it could be a family member passing and they literally have to liquidate the estate and there's an excess of resources, yeah, which would be swelling through here, it would be accumulation, it would be crunchiness, it would be too much, yeah. But if we find this cracked, lined, dehydrated, weak, hollow, then it would literally be, I don't have enough. And we'll be able to see, you know, is it really the present situation that's causing the tension? Is it something from the past that keeps nagging at them? Or, you know, what's happening with the actual fuel that's driving that change? Does that make sense? Yeah. So resources could also be things like stamina. Stamina, physical stamina. Mm -hmm. Energy. Yep. And then we would apply our, our hot, cold, wet, dry, our earth, air, fire, water language in order to figure out kind of what's happening where. We find a lot of earthy, stagnant, hard, denseness in the reflexes. We know that there's maybe physical blockage in the resources. Yeah, we find that there's heaviness, there's a need to purge, there's an excess versus if we find that air, that hollowness, there's a lacking, there's a fatigue, there's less of. We find water, there's often emotions present. There's physical lymphatic stagnation, but then also there's hypersensitivity. It might be kind of like an internal game. Like it's not necessarily an issue that's external, but it's the fear of moving forward that's the problem. And then it could just be on fire. It could be literally inflamed. And that's going to be maybe they're moving too fast in all of this situation. Maybe physically they're spasmodic, they're cramping, they're in pain. Yeah. Maybe their pain is what's preventing them from moving forward. Like I would take that job, but I'm afraid I don't have the physical, like I don't know when my body's going to break next. So that's how we can look at the cuboid notch. And when we, when we look at modalities like reflexology, which zoom into the part in order to understand the whole, it can be such a magical opportunity for you to look at this one part, like so many massage therapists freak out, like how do you see the whole body through the foot? But what if we shrink that down even smaller and we look at this one particular sphere of life, which tells us so much information physically, mentally, and emotionally, and zoom that in even more to get a bigger view of what's happening. All that makes sense? Cool. And that is the cuboid now.